abundant life. It's the hallmark of our planet. But it's water that makes us unique. Liquid water is the essential environmental requirement for life on Earth. So when we look for life elsewhere, we start first by looking for liquid water. Our search has taken us to an alien world that seems to defy the laws of physics. A place where water can't exist, but shows us evidence that it might. We have uh, what we in science call an anomaly. If water is the source of life, could this desert planet be where it all began? Welcome to Mars, the water world. Load relief kick crane is in. Vehicles responding. Vehicles recovering very nicely from the liftoff transients. August 4th, 2007 at 5.26 a.m., this Delta II rocket blasts off from Cape Canaveral. In its nose cone is NASA's first robotic Mars scout, the Phoenix Lander. At this point, we have a strong signal from Phoenix via Odyssey. At NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, engineers monitor the progress of the half-billion-dollar mission. All stations, we have confirmed proof state separation and UHF signal acquisition via Odyssey. Atmospheric entry on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. The new generation lander enters the final phase of its 400 million mile journey to Mars. One minute since LOS, standing by for signal reacquisition. Phoenix will search the Arctic plains of Mars for the building blocks of life, including carbon, nitrogen, and most importantly, water. Touchdown detected. <laughs> Land in its sequence initiated. Phoenix intends to prove that life on Mars is, or was, possible. If it does, then life on Earth is not unique. This is a test simulation, but this afternoon, the team at JPL did this for real. Today, Phoenix entered the atmosphere of Mars. Primary objective of Phoenix is to explore the Martian Arctic and to determine whether or not conditions for life are there today and or existed in the past. If Phoenix finds what it's looking for, it will change our understanding of the solar system. If there's life on another world, it could mean that the universe is teeming with it, that the aliens of our science fiction could be a reality. Phoenix might even find them. But finding the signs of life on a planet millions of miles from home is an incredibly difficult challenge. The lander hasn't been designed to find life directly. It's been built to find the necessary ingredient for it, water. Chris McKay is a planetary scientist at NASA's Ames Research Center. When we look at life on Earth, we see an enormous diversity. Organisms that do all sorts of different chemistry, live in all sorts of different environments. But the one thing that all organisms on Earth have in common is a requirement for liquid water. So naturally, when we look for life elsewhere, we start first by looking for environments that have liquid water. Here on Earth, wherever there's water, there's life. Even in temperatures as extreme as 14 degrees Fahrenheit, organisms can survive. So if we find signs of water on Mars, we might find life too. But why are we looking on Mars? Professor of Geomorphology, Vic Baker, explains. 30 years ago, uh, a spacecraft called Mariner 9 produced about 9,000 pictures, many of which showed large channels and valleys. And it was very obvious that these channels and valleys are directly analogous to what we see on the Earth uh, formed by water. 
scientists are stumped by these images. It definitely looks like water erosion. But as far as they know, there is no water on Mars. Its atmosphere is too thin to support it. The air pressure on Mars is less than a hundredth of the Earth's, which means the air on Mars' surface is the same as it is here on Earth at 110,000 feet above sea level. That's 20 miles high, nearly four times the height of Mount Everest. Scott Rafkin is a planetary atmosphere specialist at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. It's fairly common knowledge that if one goes camping or hiking and you go up to higher altitudes and you go to boil your water, as you go higher up, it boils at lower and lower temperatures. That change in altitude is what you're really doing is changing pressure. As you go up in altitude, the pressure is becoming less and less. And so what happens is that as you go higher up, it becomes easier to boil water. You don't need to raise its temperature as much. This experiment shows the effects of Mars's atmospheric conditions on water. Gradually removing air from the chamber reduces the pressure. At first, nothing happens. But when the pressure drops to the equivalent of Mars's atmosphere, the water boils. Water normally boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but at this low pressure, it boils at room temperature. On Mars, this happens at just 50 degrees. The stability of, of water on any planet is tied to primarily the pressure. And the pressure on Mars is so low that if one could have liquid water sitting out on the surface, it would simply boil. Mars's ultra-thin atmosphere creates another problem for water to exist here. There's not enough of it surrounding the planet to insulate it. Mars is ice cold. At its warmest, it's just 70 degrees Fahrenheit. At its coldest, the temperature drops to minus 225. Now, of course, on Mars, we have another problem, which is that it's very, very, very cold. So even if one had the higher pressure so that the water wouldn't boil off, it would just freeze solid like a rock. The existence of these channels and valleys that appear water carved baffles scientists. The question is, how do you have these two things? How do you have a planet that is, that is cold and dry with a thin atmosphere, and yet clearly, in its past, had flowing water? Over the years, scientists have offered many theories to explain the features seen on Mars's surface. People have suggested, well, maybe it's carbon dioxide liquid, or maybe it's lava, or maybe it's wind. Well, wind, lava, carbon dioxide could have formed many of the features we see on Mars, but they can't explain all the features. And for the past 30 years, this has been the major source of science controversy, and it's uh, the, the reason that the current NASA program is uh, sort of directed with this uh, euphemism, follow the water. Using the latest science provided by Phoenix, NASA hopes to prove once and for all that they were made by liquid water, a substance that shouldn't exist on the planet. But the debate is growing more controversial. In June 2000, scientists got very excited about these images taken by the Mars Orbiter camera, a probe that has been circling the red planet since 1997. This one was taken in 1999 and this is of the same location in 2000. The images clearly reveal a changing landscape. To geologists like Vic Baker, these recently formed features look strangely familiar. On Earth, we would call them gullies. They're, they're sort of on the scale of um, hundreds of meters, uh, no more than a kilometer. They're patterns like the veins in a leaf or branches in a tree that result from how water falling on the surface organizes itself into larger and larger drainages. 
These gullies and alcoves seem to have been recently formed by water. They have appeared in the southern hemisphere of the planet, on slopes that get the least amount of sunlight during each day, one of the coldest parts of Mars. Their similarities to gullies formed by water here on Earth defy logic and the laws of physics. So what created them? Did water flow across Mars in its past? And is it still flowing today? May 25th, 2008. The Phoenix lander, NASA's $420 million mission to Mars, touches down on the red planet to answer two questions that have vexed scientists for decades. Is there water and could there be life? At the heart of this debate lies this rock that landed on Earth from Mars. Discovered in 1984 in the Antarctic, it's six inches long and weighs over four pounds. It's called the Allen Hills Meteorite, and it's one of just 34 Martian rocks that have been found here on Earth. Johnson Space Center astrobiologist Dr. David McKay has studied this meteorite for more than 10 years. Allen Hills is unique among the Mars meteorites because it's so old. It is by far the oldest of the known Mars meteorites. And furthermore, with an age of 4.5 billion, it is older than any rock ever found on the Earth. But how on Earth did it get here? Impacts have been hitting both the Moon, Mars, every object in the solar system for billions of years. Any rock that was very near the surface is propelled by the reflected shock wave off of Mars at great velocity. To leave the red planet, the Allen Hills meteorite must have been traveling faster than the planet's escape velocity, about 11,000 miles per hour. A good analogy is the surface of a trampoline. If you bounce on the trampoline, the trampoline bounces back and pushes you way up in the air. In this case, the shock wave is like the surface of the trampoline and it pushes that rock way up into space. There's plenty of evidence proving that Mars was hit by large meteorites in its past. But by matching the spectrum of minerals making up the meteorite to data collected by instruments on the Mars orbiters, scientists at the University of Hawaii believe that this is where the Allen Hills meteorite originates. It's called the Eos Chasma, a branch of the planet's enormous Valles Marineris Canyon system. These craters have the same mineral composition as that found in the Allen Hills meteorite. But what really excites scientists is what else it contains. Using high-resolution scanning electron microscopes, he examines the meteorite and discovers tiny globules of iron and magnesium carbonate. Elements almost certainly formed and deposited by liquid water. Carbonates are significant because they show that not only was water there, but it was relatively low temperature. McKay is convinced that this proves Mars's atmosphere was once very different and could sustain flowing water, so the conditions for life were present. By radioisotope dating the carbonate globules, McKay comes up with a figure. Water flowed on Mars 3.9 billion years ago. NASA's current crop of rovers scouring the planet backs up McKay's findings. <laughs> 